God would have showed us this whole picture of where it is now, back then, I, there's no way I would have come because it's so huge and massive. Um, but God kind of knows that, I think. And so he, he just kind of gives you a little bit at a time to step forward. And each, each time you get to choose, you know, am I gonna be obedient with that one thing he asked you to do? For those of you who don't know, that is my wife, Lori, and um, yeah, and they were interviewing her. We've got a docu-series coming up about, uh, you know, what God's done here at Real Life, and part of our celebration we'll be doing in a couple weeks, but, um, you know, both of us had never been in a large church. Um, when we got the call to come here, it was just a couple of families, amazing families that are still here, and... Um, and we had three months salary, and we knew we were supposed to come, but we had no idea what was gonna happen when we got here. And, and she's right in that if you'd have told us, you know, I'm an introvert. <laughs> I, I really am. And this has been uh, quite a deal for 25 years. We do this series or a form of this series every year we have for 25 years. And there's some reasons for that. Um, God did some amazing things back then. And it, it, I don't know about you, but for me, for us, the sacred can become mundane. It can become, you know, like you think about manna in the wilderness. The first time manna in the wilderness comes, yes, after a while, manna, right, again. The sacred, something special, when we get used to it, we take it for granted. And there's a reason why in the Old Testament, every seven years they would gather and go through and read the entire history of Israel. Every year, every one of the ceremonies had to do with part of the history of what God had done. God knows how quickly we forget. He warns us again and again about forgetting. And so from the very beginning, every year we do a series like this. We have a membership class. We even have uh, every year, you know, all the volunteers go back through, here's who we are, here's what we're about. Um, and so we don't want to forget that this is the story of what God did here, and we need to remember he's the hero of the story. And yes, we've learned some things along the way, but, but uh, we need to celebrate the foundations. I think about America, you know, I, I, it, America was a miracle story. God did some great things in America, but as, as you notice over time, the 4th of July became about fireworks. Thanksgiving became about turkey and football. Would you agree that as Americans, we've kind of gotten away from how we got here, what we were about, we've forgotten, wouldn't you agree? It's what happens, you know, we, we forget our marriage vows, you know, uh, that we made all those years ago. And pretty soon, um, we forgot that we made a vow before God and we committed to do things in sickness or in health. And so, we don't want to forget. Secondly, we understand that we have new people coming and we want you to know what we are about. We want you to know that we've been about this for 25 years. As uh, so many people drift and, and so much happens and people start redefining words and terms and, and things start happening to change our culture, we want you to know and we want to remind those who have been here that we are, are building on the foundation of the word of God with Christ Jesus as the cornerstone and the definitions of the words were given by God and he didn't change them, so neither are we. Amen. Now, over the years, we've had to make some changes. Like, for instance, I remember when we had to add to our membership covenant and our doctrinal statement about marriages between one man and one woman. We didn't change our mind about that. We had always believed that. It just wasn't even in question. Well, now as the culture starts going crazy, it becomes a question, so we're gonna go back to what we had always believed. Does that make sense? 
And you know, now I'm gonna, we might have to go back, our, our, our eldership team, everything is governed and over, ordered by our, our eldership team. We're gonna have to go back and go, when you're a human, you're not a furry, you're not an animal, you're a human. <laughs> not because we have some new epiphany. Hey, humans are not animals. But because that's what the word has always said. And so we're gonna stick with this, and during this series, we're gonna go through where we came from, what we believe in, what we've held to, and to remind our folks, because again, people drift, but to, to those of you who are here that are new, we want you to know, and we want you to hold to that, and we want you to join us. We really want you to join us in what God has been doing here. That's our, our hope. But again, if you come, we want you to know before you really get involved what we're about because um, we know that some people really get involved and all of a sudden they go, wait a minute, you believe that? We're, we're, we're out. And then, then everybody's kind of upset. Well, why didn't somebody figure that out in advance? So we're like, hey, you want to come? Here's what we're about. We'll put it on the bottom shelf. We're going to walk through it. And then you decide to join us. We're not begging anybody because this is a blessing. It's from God. And we hope you come. But if not, there's other churches out there. Making sense to you? All right, so here's what we're going to do. A, a couple of things. I, I want you to understand that we recognize that there are some things built into the human race that cause problems. Forgetting is one of those things, but having different definitions of words uh, can cause a problem. I found out in my marriage that her definition of a word is different than my definition of a word. I find out everywhere I go, we have different definitions. And it's really helpful. Uh, I come from the coaching sports background. I think about football. And you call play in the huddle. And it might be, I remember, uh, 32 dive from my high school years. Uh, I played two different teams. I played in high school in one team. And then I moved and played in high school in another. And it was not the same playbook. They didn't call the plays the same thing. But when they got in the huddle, if I would have been, if, if I wouldn't have learned the new playbook and they'd have called a, you know, the play, it didn't matter how much talent I had or we had as a team. If we weren't running by the same play with the same language, it didn't matter how much talent we had, we couldn't win. Would you agree? In, in music, let's say you're more of a musical person. You can have the best musicians in the world, but if they're not on the same sheet of music, they aren't defining the notes the same way. They don't understand their part. It sounds terrible. We recognize that many people come from different backgrounds within the Christian world. Uh, different uh, terms, different ways of understanding words. Then you add in new believers and even those who came from cults and, and other religions and, and we've got somehow we have to get aligned around what is the mission and vision of the church, what is the language we're gonna use, or we can't win. Jesus said a house divided against itself cannot stand. And so we have, this is why we have our membership classes. Not because you're not a Christian if you don't come here and take our membership class. It's because we recognize built into the system is a problem. And then you're reading different books by different coaches and pastors and you're listening to different radio programs and that's great. But we've got to come together and go, when we say something here, do we all understand what we mean? That's important. So here's some things that we want you to know. Um, we believe that God wants his church to be unified. I, I was thinking about 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 10. I appeal to you, brothers and sisters, in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that all of you agree with one another in what you say and that there be no divisions among you, but that you are perfectly united in mind and thought. That's the goal. And, and when that happens, when we are working together, we understand maturity the same way. We're, we're working uh, as a team, uh, understanding our positions, but understanding we're all a part of the team, things change. I, I think about Ephesians chapter three, verse 10. It says this, his intent, Christ's, Christ's intent, was that now through the church, 
the manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in the heavenly realms. God created a church. The church is God's idea, but not just any church. His church is his idea. God has no obligation to, to uh, bless the, a church if it's not his. And you have to go, okay, what makes a church his church? Well, it'd be one built on the foundation of the word of God with Christ as the cornerstone. It'd be one that, that we find in scripture, and in scripture, you don't just learn about what's right and what's wrong. You don't just learn about that Jesus is the son of the living God and the only way to salvation. You learn about the organizational structure of the home, of the church. There are some people that wanna, I, this, this is so aggravating to me, there are some people that they, they're like, uh, homosexuality is sin, or adultery is sin, or whatever, that something is sin, yet they completely ignore what God says about the church. Who gives you the right to pick and choose which passages of scripture you're going to affirm and deny? The Bible clearly outlines that Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. Well, how is he going to build his church? He gave the apostles the task of building that which he gave them, the directions he gave for the church, their, their responsibility was to build that out. He gave them the authority and the power to do it, and they did it. We see that in Acts. We see that in the, in the epistles, the letters written to the church. You see a structure there, a purpose there. And so for us, we believe that all Scripture is God-breathed. Right? It's used for training, correcting in righteousness so the man of God may be thoroughly equipped for every good work. It, 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 it got, Jesus said, for the man who hears my words and puts them into practice like a man who builds his house on the rock, when the rain comes, when the wind comes, the house on the rock stands firm. His words were meant to be heard, understood, and lived out. And they were given through the apostles. With them as the foundation, Christ as the cornerstone. All right, so having understood that, we as a church have some, a vision, a mission, and a purpose that we're going to walk through. But all of this is to bring glory to God. Remember, the church was supposed to reveal the manifold wisdom of God. In my life, uh, I rejected Jesus for a lot of different reasons early on, but one of them was because of how I saw what I thought was God's team functioning or not functioning. If the church was his idea, and this is what it looked like, I thought, then he must not be very smart. If the wisdom of God is revealed in the church, then when we're not doing what we're supposed to be doing, God gets the blame for the foolishness of the church. And so what we decided 25 years ago is we were going to define terms biblically. We started in a little house with just a few families. And we were going to apply God's word to every part, including the church. And so we came up with some statements that we get right from scripture. So we're going to share them with you first. Uh, our vision statement as a church, here it is. We are going to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. Now I'm going to break down some of these words for you. Here's what we meant. We spoke of the collective, the church. One person at a time spoke of individuals sharing their faith. We recognized that there was something that the church did collectively together, and there's something that each of us as individuals did wherever we worked, lived and played. So while we come together as a church, when we leave here, you walk with Jesus into every sphere of your life, and you have an individual responsibility out there as Christians, but collectively we have a gathered responsibility, the collective responsibility of the church. Now I want you to notice it says, we will, notice this word, reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. 
See, a lot of churches, they, they, they kind of act as though it's a fort inside of enemy territory. We're all going to run inside the fort. We're all going to hide in here. And, 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 and it, you know, this is our safe place. And, and, and we don't want anybody coming in here unless they already agree with us. They already think uh, they, they need to leave the world behind. We're going to gather in here and you guys stay out there. But that's not what Jesus did or said. Jesus left heaven and came into the world to reach us. Jesus sent his disciples out. Go therefore into the world and make disciples, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you. There is this, we are going into the world. Now, there are safe spaces that we're, that we're trying our best to be the church and safe in here, but we're, we're collect- this is like the locker room before we hit the field. We're a team. We're together. Now, as we go out there, wherever we lurk, work, live, and play, we're launching out there with the mission, uh, the vision of Jesus. He came to seek and to save the lost. He wants us to reach outside these walls. So that's why we, we feed thousands of people a month. That's why we did the sports and outdoors facilities, because we knew that, that maybe we could meet some people there that thought their need was sports for their kids, which is a little silly to me, because one thing I've noticed from professional athletes, they're not all that ethical. They're not all that happy. But there's nothing wrong. Sports are a good tool. It's just a terrible God. What we do is we're going to meet people where they're at. This is why we have recovery ministry and jail ministry. And this is why we reach and partner with the schools. This is why we do the things we do. Because we both collectively and individually are going to reach into the world. Because we believe that people need to be saved. There's two categories of people, not Republican and Democrat. Not black and white or American and, and immigrant. Those, aren't, those, those distinctions exist, but they're not most important. It's saved and unsaved. And so as, as a Christian, we, we get excited when people accept Christ, right? We want to have this kind of attitude. Hey, you know what? It's raining and it's snowy outside. And look at this. I have to park so far away from the building because there's so many cars here. Yes! People are coming to know Jesus here, and people want to come here, and I'm really glad and willing. And you know what? We had so many kids coming to hear about Jesus. Yes, they need more sponsors and leaders to help. I'm in because we're going to reach the world for Jesus. I mean, some people are like, I like a small church where I know everybody and it's comfortable and all that. I'm like, well, okay. Um, Do you think Jesus wants a small church? Does he wait to return because he wants a small church or because he wants people to come to know Jesus? Now, I'm not against a small church if that small church is doing everything they can to reach lost people and make disciples. But if it's small because it wants to be small, it's lost the heart of God. God wishes none to be lost and everyone to be saved. I think about the 23 baptisms we had last week. Which of the 23 do you want us to say, hey, uh, we're too big here, you need to go somewhere else. (laughs) We're gonna reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. Secondly, here's our mission statement. We're gonna make biblical disciples in relational environments. The word biblical there, biblical disciples. We're gonna teach people to obey all that Jesus commanded in every part of their life. Biblical disciples. Why disciples? Well, because the early church, were, they were told to go make disciples, not converts. They were told to go and, yes, introduce people to Jesus, but then and baptize them as a picture of dying to the old life. That's the starting line. But now we're going to teach you to obey all that's commanded. Every, listen, they didn't call Christians Christians till much later. The early church, they were all disciples. Everybody was a disciple. So if you believe that the disciples were somebody else, those guys over there, you're not a disciple, well, you, you've missed it. You've missed it. 
You're supposed to be a disciple. We're going to make biblical disciples. What is a disciple? We use Matthew chapter 419 as our guide. In the invitation, when Jesus called the disciples, he, he gave them the definition. He said, come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. So what is a disciple? A disciple is one who's following Jesus. As they are following Jesus, they are being changed by Jesus. And then finally, they're becoming on mission with Jesus. They're, they're committed to the mission of Jesus. Come and follow me and I'll make you fishers of men. Every disciple, every Christian who gave their life to Jesus was to be a disciple, and a disciple learned to follow Jesus. They were changed by Jesus, and they were committed to the mission of Jesus. So here's the deal. If if you're uh, not following Jesus, I just want you to hear this, then you're not a disciple of Jesus. If you're not a disciple of Jesus, you're not saved. There's not the saved ones who have hell insurance because they're Christians, but then the disciples who actually do something about it. Romans chapter one says we're called to the obedience that comes from faith. Faith leads to obedience. Now, again, we're in a process. There's some people who just got saved. They don't quite know everything that the Lord's teaching, and there's this process, and I'm glad God gives grace as we learn the process. But if you're like, I want to be saved, I want my hell insurance, but I don't want to follow Jesus, you're not a Christian. Because he is king of kings and lord of lords. And in the kingdom of heaven, there's a king. And you ain't it. Neither am I. If you're not being changed by Jesus, if there's not growing fruit in your life, a change that's happening, then the Holy Spirit, when he moves inside of you, he changes you, he sanctifies you. If you're not being changed, then, then the Holy Spirit's not there. And if the Holy Spirit's not there, Corinthians, 1 Corinthians says, then you're not really, you don't really belong to God. Well, I checked the, che- I checked the mark. I was baptized. Or I prayed the prayer. I'm a Christian. I, no, you're not following Jesus. You're not being changed by Jesus. You, Jesus said you know a tree by its fruit. The changing in the fruit of your life comes from the Holy Spirit. If you're not committed to the mission of Jesus, the mission of Jesus is to reach people and teach them to obey. There are a lot of people that they, they go to church, but they're not committed to the collective mission of, of Jesus. When, when this, we call this church Real Life Ministries for this reason. 2 Corinthians 5 says that we were reconciled to God through Christ and we have been given the ministry of reconciliation. We are ambassadors. We implore others on behalf of Christ to be reconciled to God. We were ministers. We're supposed to be ministers of reconciliation. All of us. Jesus said, if you're going to be my disciple, you're going to help me on my mission. You're going to become a fisher of men on my behalf. So if you're not committed to that, then there's a real problem in your life. And I don't want anybody in here today leaving going, man, I was confused. I didn't know you actually had to follow Jesus. And I, was just, I just prayed this prayer because this guy on TV said, hey, send 1595 to get a prayer rag and hell insurance. <laughs> We're called on to be disciples. We're gonna make biblical disciples in relational environments. Why relational environments? Well, because when Jesus sent out his 12 disciples, he said, go therefore and make disciples. He didn't mean go do it any way you want. He had just made disciples out of them. They had spent time with him. They had learned what it looks like. How many disciples did Jesus have? 12. In relationship, he made disciples. He did big group stuff, and then he did small group stuff. And when the disciples went out into the world, guess what? They preached, thousands came to know the Lord, and then they met together in Acts 2, look for yourself. They met together in the temple courts, large group, collective. There's things that happen in a large group that cannot happen in a small group. We're able to feed thousands of people. We're able to do mission work around the world. We're able to do some things because there's a collection financially, Human resource-wise, we can do big things. They did that in the early church too. They took care of all the Greek widows because people brought a collection to help people that were hurting. They sent missionaries off. They cared about one another. You see that in Acts 2. They met in the temple courts and 
from house to house daily. Why house to house? Well, because yes, there's a teaching that can happen in the big group, but it's got to move beyond the big group to practical disciple-making where the more mature are ministering to the less mature people are growing up. They're finding support and accountability. They're doing life together. See, God never asked us to go to church like it was an event. He asked us, yes, we came together in a large group, and there are things that happen there that don't happen other places, but we are in a family, a body. We are moving to becoming people who are completely committed to the kingdom of heaven above all other kingdoms. My own personal kingdom, the country I live in, the business I do. It's the kingdom of heaven with Lord Jesus Christ as the head. And we together become the church. And so as you start to unpack the vision, we're going to reach the world for Jesus one person at a time. The mission, we're going to make biblical disciples in relational environment. And then thirdly, you're going to notice in all of our literature, in everything we've done, is we're going to follow the process that we see in Scripture for disciple making. So let's just walk through that real quick. Here's the process of discipleship. And here's what I would encourage you to do. As many times we read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We read the New Testament. And we look for doctrine. We look for the gospel. But often we don't picture the scene in which this is happening. We don't look at the method And there really is a method that Jesus used that he told his disciples to follow. Here's the method that we describe here as you walk through. This is the the, the way we call it here at Real Life. Uh, The Bible tells us that Jesus left, God the Son was sent by God the Father, left heaven, came down to earth, and he shared who he was. He shared who he was. He shared himself with people. And, And those who who saw him, he shared the truth with them. Now, why do we use the word share? Well, because sharing implies something different than telling. Would you agree with that? If I tell you something, I'm not really, it's like information. I'm not sharing my heart with you if I'm just telling. I'm not sharing who I am with you. God shared himself and the truth with people. Now, the next thing that happened is he shared that some people believed in him, and he invited into connection, into connection. Now, when they, when they came into this connection, he said, come and be with me, and, and, and you know what they were thinking? They're thinking, if we follow him, we're gonna get to sit at the right hand of the throne. We're gonna get to be big shots. How do I know that's what they thought? Because it's all throughout the New Testament. They were fighting over who were the greatest in the kingdom of heaven was. See, when they first started following Jesus, they were consumers. I want to consume. I want more. Give me more. I want the top spot. I want this. They were fighting about all this stuff. But as they spent time with God the Son, they started realizing the truth. He would be first, must be last. Love is to give your life away. Love is to to care about people's eternity even though they may treat you wrong. He started moving them in this connection from consumer to a minister. So I want you to notice how he did that. Uh, He's in connection with them. Now he's he's teaching them to be ministers. At first he's like, hand out that bread and those loaves. Put them into groups of 50. Go, uh, he starts teaching them, go get the, the donkey. Go to the towns and, and serve. And, and he's starting to teach them how when you see that sick person on the side of the road. They're not a nuisance because they're, cry, they're crying out, Jesus, Messiah, will you save me? No, no, they're people who need love. And he's moving them to become ministers, using their gifts and their abilities to serve others. There's a heart change that's going on in them. Can you see it? Share, connect, train them for ministry. Then he would send them out by twos and he'd come back and debrief them. He's getting them ready. Then when he he dies on the cross, he raises from the dead. He gives them the Holy Spirit. Now he sends them out to become disciple makers who did the exact same thing. 
The early church on Acts chapter two, Peter gets up in front of 3,000 people after Jesus is resurrected from the dead and he preaches this sermon. He's just this fisherman. It wasn't this big, eloquent sermon. It, it, there was things happening, speak, it, mar- tongues of fire. I mean, it was more about what God was doing than how brilliant a speaker he was. But he said, this Jesus whom you crucified was both Lord and Christ. And when the people heard this, they were pierced to the heart. And they said, brothers, what shall we do? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the forgiveness of your sins. So you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. And this promise is for you and all who are far off, for all whom the Lord our God will call. And then as you read in that Acts 2 passage, they immediately, it says Acts 2, 41 and 42. He says, then... All the believers devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, to the word of God, to fellowship. Whoa, there's, there's the C. There's the C, the connection. To fellowship in the temple courts and from house to house. They ate together with glad and sincere hearts, relationship. They, they took communion together. They sold their possessions and goods to give to whomever ever had need. There's the M. They're moving from share, connect. Now they're moving to minister. Now they're ministering. Now they don't see people as a hassle and a problem, even though they are. They start looking past people's faults. They start ministering there to others. They start taking care of the Greek widows. They start even helping people that weren't believers because it says there that at the end of it, it says, and they enjoyed the favor of all the people, even the Jews who weren't believers. Why? It's really hard to hate someone that loves you no matter what and will sell their stuff to minister to you. And then it says the Lord added to their number daily those who were being saved. Who added to their number daily? The Lord did. What what were the people doing? They're just being, they're being shaped. They, they, they know Jesus. They have a relationship with him now. They're connected. They're ministering to others and, and they're sharing what they have. They're, they're, they're preaching about Jesus one-on-one and collectively together. And, and now the Lord adds to their number. The Lord's doing work. People want in. It's really, you know, when people are acting like that, they want in. Whatever's happened to you people, it's changed you. And you know what? They didn't go, well, you can't come in because we already have 3,000. It's over. Too many people. I moved to North Idaho to get away from people. I see the people who are coming here as uh, refugees who need to find a place that's safe because the world's gone crazy or they're being driven here because they need Jesus and we get to be the place that tells them if they'll come. Not everybody here is clapping right now. Some of you are like, okay, we'll accept everybody but the Californians. No. No. Those people have been tested. They've had it tougher than we have. They could teach us a few things on some things. Now, listen to me now. As you go through the story, then they started going to Antioch, sending out disciples everywhere because their goal wasn't just Jerusalem. It was Samaria. Samaria. It was all of Israel, it was the the nations, the world, because they were told to go. But wait a minute, it's not comfortable. I've got my friends here. I've got all these people that I love here. You know, I don't want to go. But wait a minute, King Jesus said to go. It's not about our comfort. Comfort's coming in eternal life, new heaven, new earth. We're in a war zone. We have a mission. In the next several weeks, we're going to be unpacking seven um, sort of value statements that we believe in, that we as a staff and eldership want to live out, as key leaders here at this church want to live out, but we want to invite you into these behaviors with us. Because a culture is when we all come together, gather together, and we create and protect culture collectively, but life on life. And so we're going to ask you in the next uh, several weeks to decide to, uh, you know what, 
I'm gonna do that. I wanna be a part of that. I wanna be a part of this church family that's on the move, that's trying to plant churches and go on missions work around the world. And in Kootenai County, we're gonna go life on life. I wanna be a part of something that's going forward. And I don't just wanna go there, attend there, and consume there. I wanna take my next step so that I can become a part of that culture to protect it, build it. But the first of all of this is very simple, and you hear it from us quite often. The no, step number one is this, before we get to two, three, four, five, six, and seven. And it's always number one. Now that you've received Jesus Christ, he shared who he is with you, and you received him. It's not a box you checked, it's a relationship you have, and it's an abiding relationship. It's an abiding relationship. See, it's in your abiding relationship with Jesus that you get the directions for your life, the power source to live that out. Jesus said this in John chapter 15, and it's a passage of scripture we lose, use a lot. It says this in verse one. I am the true vine and my father is the gardener. He cuts off every branch in me that bears no fruit, but while every branch that does bear fruit, he prunes so that it will be even more fruitful. You are already clean because of the word I have spoken to you. Remain in me. That word is abide, stay, stay plugged into me as I also remain in you. No branch can bear fruit by itself. It must remain in the vine. Neither can you bear fruit unless you remain in me. I am the vine, you are the branches. If you remain in me and I in you, you will bear much fruit, but apart from me, you can do nothing. Everything else we're gonna talk about in the next several weeks, reaching the lost collectively and individually, connecting ourselves and, and connecting, help to connect other people. Pursuing those who are drifting away from the Lord, chasing the strays. Shepherding people towards maturity. Identifying people's giftings and helping them get plugged in. Identifying, training, releasing leaders and then unity as a church. All of those other six things don't happen if we don't abide in Christ. See, when, if you decide not to abide in Christ, you quit doing the things that God would ask you to do because you, you know, you're, you're just like, I'm not doing it anymore and I'm not gonna keep doing what he asked me to do. I'm not gonna plug into him. The power source for all of this and the heart behind it is found in your abiding relationship. Now, some people will continue to reach the lost and they'll do some of those things, but if you continue to do the action without the heart and the power, it becomes a form of manipulation it becomes doing things for God without being in relationship with God, and that leads to all kinds of different problems. Like, you know, the Pharisees, they would stand on the corner and give, but they did it so everybody could see it. So it looks like they're being spiritual, but their heart really wasn't for God. Their heart was, money is less important to me than power and influence and reputation. So you can give, if, if you're not abiding in Christ, it's usually about you get something. You can, you can uh, actually tell people about Jesus because you want to have a mark on your Bible and you want to, it's like a work salvation. You want to do this or do that to impress other people. But if your heart isn't out of humility knowing you were saved, and God loves lost people, and you're not plugged into his heart, then you see people as tools or something to be avoided. It's only as we plug into him that we have the ability to love difficult people. And by the way, that's all there is to deal with. Do you have a relationship with God? I, people are like, well yeah, I was baptized in 1974. I didn't ask when you were baptized. Do you have a relationship with God? Now again, when you have a relationship with God and you're gonna be obedient to him, you're baptized. But just because you're baptized doesn't mean you're walking with Jesus. You may have walked with him for years, but somewhere along the line, things became mundane and empty and just went through the motions because that's what you do. 
That's easy to do. I've been there. I've had people go, hey, what's going on with you? The Holy Spirit's had to speak to me, and I've had to go, you know what? I've got to get away from all this. I, I'm falling into this doing for and not with. And it will happen in your life, too. It happens to people, and, and the Holy Spirit screams out to us, and, and he calls to us, and, and we have to go, you know what? Time out. I'm going to press into you, Lord. Thank you for calling me. Here's what I'm hoping will happen in this series. That we will remember where we came from, who God is, what he's done. That he gave us a mission. He has a purpose for our life. We were saved from our sin and death and hell and saved for the kingdom of heaven and God's purposes. Those of you who have been here for 25 years or 20 or 15 or 10, we do this every year because, again, it could happen to any of us. We forget who we are. For those of you who are new, we are hoping that God brought you here not to be a consumer, not to be a critic, because if you are, you'll find plenty to criticize. There are people here. But you'll be a spirit-filled person who fills in the gaps, looks past faults, ministers to people who are struggling, has the courage to help us get back on track when, not if, we drift a bit. We want to be a community of people that honors God and stays the course in our slice of history all the way till the end of it. God has done miraculous things here and he's not done unless we are. We're going to take communion. This reminds us of who we are, that we're here together, that we're part of the body of Christ, that we need him. And he wants to save us and forgive us and walk with us. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this day. I pray for our church, that we'd bring glory to you. Thank you for your Holy Spirit who reminds us when we're off course, when we're forgetful. Thank you for the spirit of grace that you give us and you give to us through people. Help us to bring you glory, Lord. There are people still out there. If you were to return today, they would be lost. Help us to be ambassadors for you, empowered by you. In Jesus' name, amen.